Hi, I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher at Trinity University Press. Thank you for joining us for the Maverick Book Club. As a nonprofit cultural and educational publisher, we are committed to an evolving agenda of work that engages, provokes, and brings us together as community in increasingly productive ways. As such, we could, be, we could not be more proud of the new book, Revolutionary Women of Texas and Me Mexico, and the rightful attention that it is receiving. Much ink has been spilled over the men of the Mexican Revolution, but far less has been written about its women. Book editors Kathy Sosa, Ellen Clark, and Jennifer Speed set out to write this wrong. This anthology embraces an important and expansive idea of revolutionary by looking at women who have stood up for their visions and ideals. The collection is introduced by Jennifer Speed, followed by 18 individual portraits that range from artists such as Frida Kahlo to activists like Emma Taniyuka and Genoveva Morales as, and many others. Each profile is pinned by a different modern day contributor such as Sandra Cisneros, Laura Esquivel, and Carmen Tafoya. And the perfect touch is pen and ink illustrations throughout by Kathy and Lionel Sosa. We so appreciate everyone's participation in this important project. Bookending the project is a foreword by civil rights activist Dolores Huerta and an afterword by acclaimed scholar Norma Cantu. I'll also take a moment to acknowledge the Trinity editor for this book, Margie Avery. It's an understatement to say that we all have been honored to work with the entire team. Joining us for the program are Sandra Cisneros, Ellen Clark, and Kathy Sosa. Norma Cantu has generously agreed to host this conversation. She is the Noreen R. and T. Frank Murchison Distinguished Professor of the Humanities at Trinity University. She's also the author and editor of many books, the most recent of which is Cabanuelas, a novel. Enjoy yourself, and at the end, don't forget to check out the books we'll all be reading and talking about next month. Two books, The Spirit of Tequila by Joel Salcido and How the Gringos Stole Tequila by Chantal Martineau. All books are available to you at a special 20% discount using the promo code shown in the program, or simply visit us online at tupress.org to discover other books and events. Again, thank you for joining us and welcome to Norma who will further introduce the program and the participants, Sandra, Ellen, and Kathy. Thank you, Tom, and welcome everyone. Buenas noches, good evening. It really is an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. And I hope that, I know it's gonna be a wonderful conversation around a wonderful book that's just come out. So I would like to introduce our speakers, our guests, the two co-editors out of three, and one of our contributors. And then I will open it up for questions. I have a few questions of myself, but I will invite you to either post questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen or in the chat. It would be um, an honor to have these questions come in and I'll try to monitor that and make sure everybody gets an answer, but we may not get to everyone. So in the spirit of tonight, I welcome you to also continue talking about revolution and about revolutionary women. So first of all, one of our co-editors, and I would think the, the, in, the person who was inspired to bring this project forth, Kathy Sosa. Kathy has been a teacher, marketer, political consultant, designer, curator, and so on and so forth. But I know her as an artist. And I think the uh, artwork in the book is a good example of what a talented artist she is. In 2010, she began investigating the Mexican Revolution and its impact on the demographics, culture, and future of Texas and the United States. But I'll ask her a question later to have her give us more information on that. But she helped develop a series of multimedia projects to promote a clearer understanding of this cataclysmic event, the Mexican Revolution. And so um, this is one of her projects. Our second co-editor here tonight is Ellen Riojas Clark, a dear colleague and friend from UTSA days. She is Professor Emerita at UTSA and her research examines ethnic and cultural identity and cultural studies 
topics. As a folklorist, I can tell you that I admire her work and value the incredible contribution she's made in areas such as food waste with her work on tamales and pan dulce, on traditions, uh, many of which she would have her students in her classes research. She also is executive producer for the Latino Artist Speaks Exploring Who I Am series. And her publications include multicultural literature for Latino children, their worlds, their, their words, their worlds, Don Moises Espino del Castillo y sus Calaveras, wonderful folklore tradition for Day of the Dead, and a forthcoming book, Pan Dulce, a compendium of Mexican pastries that I can't wait for. It's going to be a wonderful book. The third co-editor, Jennifer Speed, is not with us tonight, but we do have uh, esteemed author and dear friend, Sandra Cisneros, who is a contributor in our book. Sandra celebrates more than 50 years as an activist poet, and she's a fiction writer, essayist, educator, and artist. She probably needs no introduction to anyone on this uh, webinar tonight. Uh, her novel, The House on Mango Street, has been translated into multiple languages and is used in classrooms all over the world. She received the MacArthur Fellowship and the Texas Medal for the Arts and the National Medal of the Arts, and of course, many other awards. But I think uh, as a dear friend, I just want to say thank you, Sandra, for all the work you've done and for supporting writers and other artists as well. So let us begin. Uh, so, Kathy, why don't you tell us about how this came about? How did this book come into being? Well, um, thanks, Norma. The, the, uh, uh, ten years ago now, um, I was in a folk art shop in Bernie, Texas, and met a man who handed me an essay that he had written about the Mexican Revolution and its impact on Texas. And I was really... Uh, really opened my eyes and my mind to this idea, but also a big question of if this is true, why don't we know about this? Why don't we understand it? Why aren't we proud of it? Why aren't we pointing to it? Um, and so I took the essay home uh, and started a conversation with my husband who had told me over the years about his, both of his grandmothers had come to San Antonio during the Mexican Revolution without husband, with bringing little children and starting all over from zero uh, after having had a life uh, in Mexico. And I said, you know, uh, if this, uh, could it be that that's not coincidental that both of your grandmothers came to San Antonio in, in similar circumstances? And if this essay, what, uh, what, the, the, what he is stating here, if that's correct, then almost everybody we know who is of Mexican ancestry in San Antonio would not be here were it not for the Mexican Revolution. So we had our hypothesis and we went to El Mirador, which is no longer open, but it was a restaurant where we saw almost everybody we knew every Saturday morning. And we just ambushed people on their way in, asked them to sit at our table and asked them if they had an ancestor that came to San Antonio during the Mexican Revolution. And Norma, every last one of them said yes, every last one. So we said, uh, wow. <laughs> we felt like we'd walked into a chasm in Texas history and really felt like we had to do something about it. So, you know, my mind is, uh, races all the time. I said, oh, this could be a documentary film. Oh, this could be uh, a book about the women. Oh, this could be an art exhibition. And Lionel said, well, what part should I do? And I said, well, part, what part do you want to do? And he said, I'll do the documentary. And I felt, it felt to me like in five minutes, there was this elaborate documentary that was completed and aired on KLRN. The book about the women has taken a little longer. Uh, it has a lot of moving parts. It's uh, um, a labor of love for uh, Ellen and Jennifer and Sandra and, and I. I took the idea way back then and said, uh, convened a little lunch where I asked my 
uh, my partners, Sandra and Ellen, what they thought of the idea of the concept of the book. And they helped me lay it out and form it. Um, and from there, it was, uh, it was on its way. It just took quite a while to put together. Thank you so much. You know, I believe every book has a life, a story. And I think this origin story for revolutionary women of Texas and Mexico is a beautiful story about inspiration, but also you saw a need and then you said, let's do something about it. And that in itself is revolutionary. So thank you so much. Ellen, I'm gonna go now to you and just tell us about the authors that you're included and the criteria that you came up with to include, because there's hundreds, if not thousands of women that could be in a book like this. How did you select? How did you sift through all of that? Well, I think the major thing, Norma, is the underrepresentation of women, in particular Latina women, has always been there. So yes, all of this started with a revolution but there were many, many women before then in this area, before it, when it was already uh, part of Mexico. So the revolution has been around since the beginning of time. So it's just finding who are those people that are uh, have been prominent and um, that no one knows about. Well, this is say most people that know about the majority of these women. So how did we do it? I think that we went back and forth on this a lot and then decided to de develop it into three sections, the post, the present, and, and, and the now, contemporary one, and then try to sift through the many women. And by the way, Norma, this is a beginning. It's just going to stimulate other writers to do a much more inclusion of all the women that are not included. But for example, for me, one of the strongest women was Sor Juana de la Cruz that now is so popular, but we have known about her. But I remember very distinctly talking to a new incoming educational philosophy professor and I asked him, oh, you're going to include Sor Juana in your study. And of course he didn't know who she was. He had never studied her, known about her. So how if it's not, if the professors don't know about it, they're not gonna be able to teach it. So culling it was, who do we know in these arenas and these three sections that would stand out? And that's how we started. And then of course, um, who do we know that's doing the research of the work in these areas and finding those particular authors to write about them? What a brilliant well, organizational chart, <laughs> because it really, the revolution is ongoing. And of course there was a historical event, the Mexican revolution and that happened. And yes, the women were there and they have been ignored, but there were women before then and there were women after. So, so right. wonderful. Uh, I want to now ask Sandra, you have two pieces here of very diverse characters, Teresita Urrea and Chabela Vargas. Can you tell us about those two or how you, uh, I don't know, how you think of them as revolutionaries? I think they are, and of course they're in the book, but how do you see it? Well, first, thank you for having me. Nice to see you, Norma, and I nice know. to see you, Kathy and Ellen. It's a great opportunity for us to get together. Um, you know, I, I always have looked through the rubble of history for stories for women that inspire me, you know, because I'm tired of looking at like uh, other anthologies that will say, you know, incredible revolutionary women of the world, but none of them are from the Americas. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just tired of that, of, of whether it's Diosas or historical mm -hmm. women. I'm just, they, they, they usually skip the, especially Latin America. So um, there's always in my brain, a little file that I create for women I admire that I want to write about. Some of them have made cameos in my work and some of them are, I hope, in future projects. And, you know, one of them was Teresita Urrea. I wanted to write a, a story, a novel about her, but then her aunt, her descendant, Luis Urrea said, hey, that's my great, great grand aunt. I want to write about her. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> so, you, you know, blood is stronger than, than ink. Go ahead. And so he, he, he got to write about Teresita Urrea, but I felt like he didn't get 
uh, angle that I would have picked. So this was an opportunity for me to write about it uh, and to write about her in a way that I would have if I had written his novel. And also there are other women that aren't here, you know, that are my heroes, uh, along with Teresita Orrea, um, Maria Sabina, for example, the uh, Mazatec Oaxacan woman, shamaness. And, you know, so there are many women, we all know many more that could be in here, but we wanted to finish the project, otherwise we'd still be working <laughs> on it. So th I hope this is just uh, a beginning. So if people say, hey, how come Maria Sabina isn't in? Well, you know, you, you can write that story. I will certainly write that story, but this was a wonderful place to begin. And I'm gonna encourage Kathy to, to take the drawings and put them together as a coloring book for oh. young women. Cause I was just thinking, I wish I had my markers so I could color these pictures but maybe that's another project we don't want to get carried away and the fact that you know you you know very well Norma how long projects take so we had to put a cap on that and for me um Chavela Vargas I, I there's a reprint from something I was asked to do uh when Chavela died and um I didn't know if I was up to the task but I I had to think about it for an hour and uh, then I said, yes, I'll, I'll try because, you know, all of us who know her music admire her and we want other people to know and admire her too. So I guess uh, the answer very simply is they were both written con mucho amor and I hope that they're entertaining and will make people want to investigate them some more. Well, they're definitely beautifully written, pero también it touches you because, of course, they were written con, con amor, con corazón. Ella, you wrote about uh, one of my favorite revolutionaries, <laughs> Gloria Saldúa. You want to tell us about that approach and how you came to that? Of course. Yeah, I'm an alumni at Trinity University. And I had exposure in a Mexican American literature class, Woods, there. And it was wonderful. It was revolutionary in its own. But they were all male writers. All every every one that we read was male, and a, you know, I'm a product of the '60s and the '70s. So at that time, the women were not at the forefront. They were always writing and always producing. But when I came across Gloria Saldua, for me, it was she spoke to me. Um, both of us were short. Both of us were rounded. Both of us had tunis. Um, she had physical deformities. I have one eye. I immediately, immediately identified with her. And so to, to see this woman who then be, is a philosopher, I mean, definitely a philosopher, who then for me formated, I mean, formulated my theoretical framework for all research that I did as to how do we look at border crossings? What are borders? How are we in between two worlds? It was amazing. So when I brought her to UTSA, and I don't know if you remember that back in the seventies, she was revolutionary then. The small little woman who has impacted so many disciplines from women's studies to queer studies, to cultural studies, I mean, she really impacted all of those arenas. So I consider her a mentor and as someone who, who changed my worldview and my, and my perspective and someone who has so much to say to us who are Mexican-American, to those of us who are Latinas, to all women in general. But the fact that we have different perspectives how we view the world. So Gloria Sandu is, is my, my hero in that sense. And I will never forget having her come visit my students who just were enthralled with her voice. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, I hope that professors are tuning in and will use the book exactly for that purpose. We can't bring some of these people to our classrooms anymore. They've passed on, but we can introduce them through the book and more and through their work as well. Several of the pieces gather groups, the soldaderas, um, the zapatistas. So, and, and I think Kathy, you might be the one to speak about the 
two women, one story about uh, Lionel's grandmothers. Yeah. But La Soldaderas is a piece by Elena Poniatowska that is also really, really important. These were the women that followed the troops and not just to feed <laughs> and clothe their men, but also to fight alongside the men during the Mexican Revolution. And you know, that tradition goes back to pre-Columbian days. There's a poet who actually writes about being out on the battlefield mm -hmm. during before the uh, Europeans ever got here. So that tradition of the women being out in the battlefield and working alongside the men, I think uh, had been ignored. And so the soldaderas are there. And then we have the Zapatistas by Hilary Klein. She writes a beautiful essay about the role of these contemporary revolutionaries. And could you tell us about the two women, one story that Lionel wrote? Sure. So um, as I said before, both of his grandmothers, they didn't know each other, but they both had a similar story in that um, they didn't stay and fight the revolutionary war in Mexico, they said, my best chance is to make it through this chaos and violence and get my children to a safer place and start over. Um, one was from Puebla, one was from uh, Monterrey, but they both got to San Antonio and they both started all over with their with their little children. So, you know, the, the idea that you give up a life as uh, uh, a nurse and you come to San Antonio and you're a laundress and finally a midwife and uh, or you have you have a big family and a husband and one day you don't have a husband because he's conscripted by the revolutionary army or he is killed or it's a good time to go uh, look for adventure if you have a whole lot more responsibility than maybe you can deal with at a time like that. So these women have, you know, there were lots of women who, who came with their husbands, you know, it's not, wasn't, wasn't a total wave of women by themselves. There were many women whose husbands had to leave before they did because they were in trouble. They were the journalists, they were intellectuals, they were criticizing what was going on and they had to escape first and women would follow. But there were massive amounts of women alone who had to take the whole family on their shoulders and get them to a safer place and uh, sacrifice what they uh, had before and start all over. Mm -hmm. So that's that story of, of these two. Lionel's uh, paternal grandmother, as I said, started out as a, a laundress and she began to do um, laundry for the neighbors in the east side neighborhood where they first settled. And uh, his, his father would pick up the laundry on his bike and deliver the laundry uh, uh, clean to the customers. And he began to go further and further out of that neighborhood and finally decided, you know, I'm gonna go beyond this neighborhood where people can afford to pay someone else to do their laundry because the, the number of customers of people who in their neighborhood who could pay to have someone else do their laundry, there was few and far between. As a result of that, he when he became 20 years old, he started his own laundry and cleaners. It became the Prospect Hill Laundry and Cleaners on the west side. And that business supported the whole family uh, you know, through, through the time when Lionel's mother died. So, uh, and then, you know, his son is a political consultant and an advertising uh, executive who has, whose work is now in the Smithsonian um, Museum of American History's entrepreneurial exhibit. So, you know, the, the part of the point of, of making sure we understand this and the impact of this is that we wouldn't look like we do and we wouldn't behave like we do if it weren't for these women and if it weren't for this revolution. And I, as I ponder about it, you know, it's, uh, I guess historians have told themselves that the Mexican revolution was a revolution in Mexico and it stopped at the border. And so we're gonna talk about World War I in the Texas history book and we're not gonna talk about the Mexican revolution. But the truth is the Mexican revolution 
was also a revolution in Texas. It brought so many people here um, and they and their children and their children are now in leadership roles in every field that you can imagine. Absolutely. You know, when I lived in- Yeah, go ahead. What I was going to say, and the revolution continues, yes. and the role of the women in these revolutions was before then, during the revolution, and now women have always been the mainstay of the families. And we had an incredible discussion, remember, Kathy, of trying to find a term, uh, a label for these women. What do we call these women? Are they just revolutionaries? What was a characteristic? that made them be able to do that. And one of the things we came up with was mujeres valientes, you know, someone is very, very strong in their beliefs, whether it was a cultural belief, familial belief, et cetera. But the woman was the mainstay and has continued to be that. So as you said earlier, the revolution continues. I'm really proud of this moniker that we developed because, because to the extent that we know about the women who stayed to fight, we have a name for them. They're soldaderas or they're valentinas, arelitas, but there's no name for a group of women, I'm sure every bit as large, maybe even larger, that made this journey, made this trip. So the discussion about what to call them and the idea that we should call them something I thought was pretty revolutionary. Ellen's idea was Las Valientas, which was the better idea. I wanted, I, my idea was something like women with suitcases. <laughs> but you know, so an idea that you're gonna get up, you're gonna get up and you're gonna summon your courage. You're gonna summon every bit of strength that you have to uh, save yourself and your kids and get a new life in a safer place. Absolutely. And I was going to say earlier, the women who came did not just come to San Antonio and Texas, but all over the Southwest and even beyond that. When I lived in Kansas City, one of the surprises was how many people had arrived right after 1910. And of course, some of the women right away started escuelitas and teaching folklorico yes. and all of that. So definitely the impact is not just local, but pretty much nationwide, I would even say worldwide, because it really impacted a lot of different countries as well. And it also had immigrants coming to Mexico after that. So it, it's just a, a larger scenario than what usually is portrayed uh, of the revolution in Mexico. Now I would like to, Sandra, maybe you can talk about a little about including some of the women like La Malinche and La Virgen de Guadalupe, who are not normally thought of as being linked to the Mexican Revolution. And as Ellen explained, that section of the book, that part looks back at Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, characters who in their actions were revolutionary. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words about that? Uh, well, one of the things I do want to say before I forget it, because yeah. my mind is just racing, is that at a time when we're talking so much about borders and divisions, it's very interesting that this is a book about Texas and Mexico, that there wasn't a border when we talked about this, that we knew that the history was connected and that that border was porous and people were fleeing north and you know organizing the revolution and then you know in fact in San Antonio right mm -hmm. and then flowing south and there were arms and money and people and lives my ancestors as well so, uh, came up and the first place they they uh, camped and lived at was El Paso so I have that Texas part of my history as well. And I just think that it's wonderful to have a book where uh, during this time of borders and uh, polarities, it is bringing together uh, Texas and Mexico. And uh, of course, you know, where do you make the, where do you stop? Because there's so many women to include. The Malinche, of course, is a very definition of the mestizaje of Mexico, and you know you and and uh, you can you only stop at Monterrey? Do you go further south? You know where? Which stories do we leave out? And I think that's something the editors had that they could answer more than I. But there was just there's too many women that we've all each of us have discovered you yourself as well that we've all discovered in the footnotes of history. Uh, many more that we could have included. Uh, the ones we wrote about, I guess, were our favorites. But uh, if we had another decade, you know, there'd be another volume, I suppose. 
And I hope uh, Kathy doesn't take another 10 years to do another one. <laughs> Especially I see in the chat, people are asking about a children's book. And I love the idea of the coloring book. So mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Well, we've got a really good start, don't we? Because we have these black and white line drawings, you know, of, of all of of all of the subjects. So from here to a coloring book, which, which would, you know, be a teaching tool and a creative tool, I think uh, it's just a couple of steps. I don't think that's a 10 year process. I think that's a lot shorter. <laughs> Uh, I noticed that uh, you also you also included uh, people like Frida Kahlo, and and we're seeing the images now on the screen. Mm -hmm. I think they're beautiful, and they're so appropriate for a coloring book. I think it's it's made to order, uh, but uh, also characters that are known, like Frida Kahlo, or even. Um, Let's see, the, the one that I would had not, well, I had known about her, but I'm sure very few people is Jane McManus Storm Casno. Uh, mm -hmm. Linda Hudson wrote about her. And this woman came to the border and wrote about the border and left. And yet she's in this book because she was revolutionary. She was doing something no one else had done. Do you want to talk about her? She's kind of an unknown. <laughs> She, uh, she is uh, lesser known than, well, to me, a lot of the women in this book were unknown. You know, in, in, in the core of this group on this, on this Zoom, you've got people who are really deeply um, uh, knowledgeable in women's studies and in uh, Mexican American studies. Um, but as an average person who is, doesn't have that background, there were qu quite a few of the women that I had really never heard of. And, and then there were those who I had heard a lot about, but I didn't see them necessarily in a revolutionary context until we started saying, what do we mean by revolution? And by revolution, uh, I think it was Jennifer that said, you know, let's describe it as a transformative process that makes society new. So, uh, so, okay, so now we can break it wide open. We're not just talking about um, a war or, you know, we're talking about a transformative process that makes society new. So peaceful things, thoughtful actions become um, things that we can write about as, as revolutionary. So, and, J and Jane, I mean, I couldn't really believe it when I read her biography how many things she did she was she aided in in the texas war for independence she went away she became a diplomat like the only woman diplomat the first one you've heard about in in the u.s and a, uh and a war correspondent um uh, and uh, you know she she actually was was so involved in the the domestic and foreign policy of the United States at that time that some people credit her with, with the phrase manifest destiny. So she was pretty amazing. I, I was, uh, I was impressed when I read, when I read, uh, I, I could hardly believe all the things she had done. Um, so I'm, I'm proud to have her to have her as part of the book. Yeah. And right next and alongside of Alice Dickerson Montemayor from Laredo, one of my paisanas, I knew her and worked with her way back in the early 80s because she had an incredible history as the one of the first and actually founder of the Ladies Auxiliary of LULAC, a real dynamo. And even in her uh, old age. She was in her 80s at that time. She was incredibly active. She was painting. She started painting in her 70s. I mean, she was an amazing uh, revolutionary, <laughs> but I never would have thought of including her. So thank you so much for broadening that. I love that definition that Jennifer gave you because it really is inclusive of people that we might not traditionally think of as revolutionary, but in effect, they are revolutionary. Definitely. Uh, now, let me turn back to Ellen. Would you like to talk a little more, Ellen, about how, I know that in your folklore research, 
you have found uh, things that come up that surprise you. What surprised you working in this book? One of the things that I had not really thought about, Norma, was this process of transformation. How does a woman go from being a traditional person, whatever, what, what causes that person to transform and become now known as a revolutionary? Was she aware of what she was doing? What is it that provoked that point of, of becoming an Adelita and going on to not only support, but to pick up the guns, to do all that it took to ensure the process of family uh, continued or whatever process it was. That to me, I think was the most astonishing one. And I think one that merits a lot of, of, of research. Sandra, what do you think that that if we, if we just talk about transforming self, what would be some of those elements that we would think are required in order to transform? Well, I think that one of the great things about the uh, introduction by Dolores Huerta and the afterword by Norma is that they turn it around and give a mirror to the reader and say, you can do this too. And I think that, that we have to be able to have role models and we have to know that it, we have to see ourselves in a book first to say, hey, that could be me. You know, whether it's gender or ethnicity or economic level or your sexuality, if you don't see yourself, you can't imagine that you could be a part of making change. So I'm really happy with the intro and the afterword and thank uh, both of you, Norma and Dolores, for writing, uh, holding up a mirror to the reader and saying, what are you going to do to make change? And we're living in revolutionary times. If 2020 isn't a revolutionary year, I don't, I don't think I've ever lived in a year that's been so revolutionary since maybe the late 60s. So uh, to see people rising up, to see the Black Lives Matter, to pe see people demonstrating in the streets, you know, people take, uh, people are being revolutionary now. And uh, so I think this is a great timing that the book has come out at a time and young women, I hope, will look at this book and say, okay, what am I doing to be, uh, to be changing the universe, to be making it better? Yeah, and I think another thing that I would add is to be valiente. Mm -hmm. I think that I love that the, you coined that for the women who did that at that time, but I think now, we need to be valientes. Claro, a veces dicen, ah, valiente, es ta loca. <laughs> because <laughs> the, the stigma of when you step up and do something that no one else has done, or you dare to break that mold or the expectations, you're either crazy or you're really, really courageous. <laughs> or, you do it, or you do it just for yourself. All of a sudden you realize, you know, who, who you are, and what you are and what you could be. So there's some kind of epiphany, epiphany that happens that makes you think, I can do this. And it's a recognition of self. So I think to transformation, uh, you really need a point of clarity that provokes you to move on and do things, whether it's this election or this year, but something that just moves you and grabs you and say, I have to do something, whether it's for yourself, for your family, or for others. And that, to me, was a thread that ran through this whole book, was that all these women, if we go back and, and study them, I'm sure that an academic can find out some of those threads that we can define transformation, equaling revolution, or equaling being valiant, or whatever it is, that we can be able to, to develop that in our young women and so forth to say, take stock of what's happening and, and do something for self and it will spread out. Yeah, that reminds me of Carmen Tafoya's piece on Emma Tenayuca, because definitely she was a young woman when she was out there as an activist and not for herself, but for her fellow workers. And I think that's another quality really wonderful discussion here. I invite you to continue uh, posting 
comments, preferably questions that you want to ask our speakers. I, I don't I want to add something for the record. When I moved to Texas in 1984, someone, I don't know who, took me to Emma Tenayuka's house oh. and introduced me to her. And I didn't drive and I had a bicycle, so I don't know how I got there, but someone took me. And I remember having this conversation. This was before she went to live in assisted living. She was still at home. And uh, somehow the conversation of pecans came up. And I, as a Yankee, I pronounced it pecan. And she said, it's pronounced pecan. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> Another short little story. I had one of my students go interview her. And this was a white student, had never been to the West Side or anything. So she goes to Emma Tenayuka's house. And of course, I had set up the interview beforehand. And she goes in bearing her books. And Emma Tenayuka didn't even look at her. She says, what are all those books you have? Where did you get them? What are they for? And she said, well, those are the books from my class. Can you leave them here so I can read them? And that was her. She had this insatiable quest for knowledge. And she just read everything. So then it became a class project to take Emma Tenayuka a stack of books every week. Mm. It was incredible. These are great stories. There is a, a question. Since there's still a revolution happening today, what are the most important lesson or lessons that the modern mujeres should take from the women in this book? Well, one of the, one of the lessons that Dolores instructs in her in her introductory piece is don't let your fear and nervousness get in your way. You know, if you're feeling, you know, she had her mother that was, you know, pushing her and she would say, I can't do it. I can't get up there. My stomach hurts. Uh, I've got butterflies. I'm nervous. It's not the right thing for me to do. I, it obviously is not because it feels so bad. It feels so scary. And, and her mother said, that's how you know you're doing something important. That's how you know you're doing something different. So take that feeling and don't interpret it as I shouldn't be here, but interpret it as I should be here. I, I'm doing something important. I'm doing something different. It feels weird until it doesn't. You I know? Want to second, <laughs> second that, that's what I say to young writers. Mm -hmm. If you're feeling uncomfortable and it's scary, and it's really uh, disturbing you to write and live through the story you're telling, you're on the right track or, or yeah. welcome to my world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess in the spirit of that, there's another question. It says, thank you for your work. What do you say to the Latinx critics who are unhappy about having white women writing some of the pieces or editing a book about Mexican and Mexican-American women? Good question. Okay. Well, I think there's a time for coalitions, and I, um, I've always been a centrist, and I feel that there's room for everybody, and anyone who's going to pick up a pen and work alongside me on a project that I want, I'm not going to discriminate about colors. Some people are more, uh, have a different uh, philosophy, but I've always been uh, a believer that, you know, if you're going to work alongside me on an issue that's important to me and a community that's important to me, then you're my compañera. Thank you. Sure. Ellen, were you going to say something? Or? I, I think that this is a real world, right? And um, you can collaborate with anybody and everybody. We do not live in a Latino world. We live in the world of, that we exist in. And of course, we're going to have people who have the same interests. I mean, I'm, Kathy and I have known each other for, for years. We have the same passion the same commitment and the same interest for, for things. So culturally, she might be white, but culturally she knows and is part of the community and wants things to be expressed in a, in a good way. So I think, as, I think like Sandra says, if you have something to say and you're good, let's write about it, let's talk about it. I think, I think for me, the, the best part of this book was just the, the discussions we used to have. Weren't they rich, Kathy? Yeah, I mean, we, we would back and forth and with Jennifer, back and forth and back and forth. So all it is is people who share 
the same perspective, the same interest, and have the same commitments as you do. And in the chat, Cristina Ramirez says, Gloria and Saldua had a very inclusionist view, which is what yes. you're saying. The yes. more the merrier, the more that you <laughs> work with us, right? Uh, and then there's a question that's kind of a comment as well. How do you all visualize a matriarchal government as opposed to this ego-filled patriarchic government? By the way, I am so excited to read this book. I think it will be very helpful for my master's thesis. Mil gracias for paving the path. Mm, that's oh, nice. Awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you know, in the pandemic, if you look at who have been the most successful leaders mm -hmm. at controlling uh, their communities and working to keep the deaths down, it's been the world leaders that are run by women. And I think that that's not a, an accident. You know, when we look at, at this time, I... I look forward to the time when the United States and Mexico will have a woman serving. Um, that's not to say that the gender is going to make all the difference. You know, so we we know there's some women who act worse than men. Yeah. You know, we know that. You know, so uh, it's not just gender, but it's at least, it's about women who are going to lead with a. Uh, with a feminist perspective. And I, I don't think it's a quin coincidence that we're gathered here on the very week of, uh, as we're nearing the day for the Virgen de Guadalupe. And to me, she's like my role model. You know, she's from my uh, ancestors' neighborhood in Mexico City. So I like to say we're related just for the record, you know. <laughs> Geographically. <laughs> Yes. Okay, here's somebody who says, I've been working through my soul searching and my greater purpose at 43. I never finished my degree, and I wonder if I can be valiente or revolutionary without ese papel. Well, I think each of us is going to have a different answer. I know that uh, Norma's going to say, go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> All the way to <laughs> I'm going to say, yeah, all right, Norma, but if you pay for it, she'll do it. Because right now the, the, the cost of schooling is, it's just astronomical. But I think it, there's, if you look at these women here in this book, how many of them had PhDs? Not that many, maybe, I don't know. I haven't gone through the whole list, but look at last, the mujeres más valientes. You know, we, we know those women, a lot of them were our ancestors. They didn't have even documents about being citizens. And a lot of them came, started whole families, started businesses. They were immigrants at a time when, and history, when they were vilified for being immigrants. We think that vilifying immigrants is new, but actually that's been happening a long time since actually the United States was founded. It was part of like when the, when the pilgrims, they, they had written in, in their paperwork against people who were disabled and who they didn't, undesirables. So mm -hmm. that's been here since probably, if you go all the way back to beginning of time. And I just think that uh, you can look around you. To me, I'm most uh, animada, I'm most enthused. Uh, I'm living here in Mexico and seeing the women and how much they endure uh, in Mexico. There isn't a bailout. They're, they're not going to be able to get uh, food stamps or, you know, there's very little assistance for them and they're making la lucha during this time. So I admire very much. And I think we, on, we only need to look around us to see women who are doing amazing things. Yeah, totally agree. And no, you don't need the papelito to be revolutionary, <laughs> but sometimes it helps to open doors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I want to add, I wanna add uh, to something for this person, and that is I do have a paper, but it's not related to what I do now. Yes. And, uh, you know, so uh, I don't have an art, I don't have a paper for art. I never went to art school. I started making art when I was 48 and found my true love and my true passion and my, my channel for being revolutionary and my channel for my voice and my art. Um, and, you know, I take a workshop when I can and I, and I, uh, I learned from the, my, my, my real teacher is Dinah at Herwick's Art Supply because, you know, I'll say, oh, well, I want to do a screen print and she'll, she'll teach me how. So this is what you need. You need that. Da, da, da. You'll need to go and take the weekend class at, at the school. And this is how you do that. And, you know, if I want to learn something new, I just trot on over to 
Herwick's uh, <laughs> art supply and Dinah tells me how to do it. And um, so, so yeah, if I, your passion, the paper doesn't dictate your, your passion. And when you find your passion and the way that you want to be revolutionary, you just must, you just must do it. That's what Dolores would say. Just, just. But, but, <laughs> but, but if you want a paper. Yeah. Go, go get it. one. Go get one. Yes. Because that is what's going to satisfy your soul and whatever. Yes. Then you can go whatever direction. But yes, pursue why why you were interested in the first place mm -hmm. and if it's the real reason then then get it then get it yeah. and also there's a comment it says many times an education can squelch your real voice absolutely so i guess another bit of advice uh, if you feel something be valiente enough to go for it to trust that and dare to do that you don't need a papelito for that. But you do need an education. And That's I true. still feel like I'm educating myself since I left. In fact, all of the women that uh, I want to uh, write about, the cameos, Chabela, uh, Teresa Urrea, I didn't find them at school. I found them when I was digging around in the rubbles, writing, uh, researching a story about the revolution and Emiliano Zapata. And then I would find these women in the footnotes. So that education is uh, sometimes at the public library and it's sometimes at Herwick's or it's sometimes <laughs> taking a weekend class. That I'm still uh, an, a student. And I hope that we all understand that we're, we're students until the day that we close our eyes for the last time. A lot of the writers, the women writers who I admire and I hope to be like them one day when I grow up, they wrote their best books after they were 65. So those are the ones that are inspiring me now as I'm about to turn 66 this, this month. Lifelong learning. <laughs> exactly. And lifelong passion for growth and for transformation. I think, the Ellen, you were saying earlier that throughout the, the narratives, all these uh, portraits that we have, there's threads and one of them I found is transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't stay static, they move forward the, with valentia, with whatever it is that, that draws them to do that, but they all are transformed. There's a, a very beautiful arc in their life, if you will, to get to a point to where they're truly themselves and doing yes. whatever their path was. And they're not all the same, they're all different. Uh, let's see. Anyone else? Uh, let's. I, I, I. There's a lot of stuff coming in. Mm -hmm. Mostly, it's comments, very positive about using the book in classes. Um, this one says, "Hola de Woodland, California." Excuse I me, Matt. Have... Well, while you're searching for that, can yeah. I? I want to just make a comment. There that's yeah. first thing. It's fighting to come out of my lips, and that is that. Uh, when you think about these women's lives, they all had what seemed like catastrophes, like a, a revolution happened that took all their resources, took their husbands, you know, disasters. But from that disasters, it forced them to let go of life and begin a new one. And the thing that I'm learning uh, as I'm getting older is you have the long view of your life. When I look back on my life and I see all the revolutions and explosions, the, what I call the exploding cigars of life, you know, all disasters, you know, people that left you or, you know, you, everything was going so nice. And then you wind up with all this soot in your face, but they all pushed me to outside of my zone of comfort and made me do things that I was afraid to do. And I'm grateful now at, as I turn 66 for all the exploding cigars in my life, all the revolutions and the whipped cream pies that came my way. And, and we can see that in the stories of these women. So I love reading biographies because they give me animal and encourage, encouragement. And um, uh, they tell me what you're doing is okay. Don't, get, don't be afraid. This is the way I did it. You can do it too. Since this, there's no, and all of these women were plain, regular women. Uh, we're reading about them now as they became extraordinary women. But at one time, they were just just like us. And something did happen, as as Asanda put it, the exploding cigars or whatever they provoke. So don't I don't be scared of anything that provokes you and that moves you. It is a science telling you, 
you can transform to the next stage and the next level and look for them. So I think that and that's- I'm sorry. Yeah. And it's never too late to do yes. so. Right. Whether it's, you know, to pick up, you know, give it another try with another cigar <laughs> <you know? laughs> or go back to school or get involved in, in a, a, some field or idea that you're passionate about. It just never is too late to do that. Like Sandra said, the, the, the best part is usually uh, once you're mature enough to realize that it's the best part. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Uh, these women had to face the gap between hope and despair, and they turned to action. They had to face great challenges to their mental health. And for those here who lean into despair and loss and want transformation, what is the latter two? What are the breadcrumbs bread that lead to hope? And the other question is, where you say were, were again, there similarities that you saw in all or most of the women? Uh, well, I think Ellen had a hard time hearing that. So could you- Oh, I'm that? sorry. Yeah. Okay, I'll repeat it. Mm -hmm. uh, these women had to face the gap between hope and despair. They turned to action. They had to face great challenges to their mental health. And for those here who lean into despair and loss and want transformation, what is the latter two and what are the breadcrumbs that lead to hope? Um, can, may I say something? Would it be all right? If no, I go start? ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, I, one of the things we have to realize is each one of us has had really dark nights. Uh, and those dark nights of the soul is part of being alive. And uh, I want to remind everyone that sometimes uh, we're able to transform that despair through art or through music or song. And sometimes we can't do it with our art or we're too depressed to be able to lift our head from the pillow. And when we're in those really, uh, you know, longer than, than few months despair, that's when you need to find your your therapist, your bruja, your wise woman, your wise neighbor, that, that person will give you wings. And I've been there and I'm not ashamed to talk about, you know, having uh, been through a very severe depression and, uh, and how much it helped me to have someone I could talk to that was not a friend, not someone related to me, but someone who is a professional. And there are a lot of sliding scales, so you shouldn't feel like it, it's out of your league if you don't have the money. There are a lot of centers that can help us because our mental health is uh, nurtured by art, but sometimes we're not well enough to uh, feed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and somebody actually commented in an answer, I feel it's okay to be scared, but don't let fear stop us from starting a revolution. Yeah. I know I've been scared in every revolution I have started. So it's beautiful. And then there's a question, what is the great divide between a male revolucionario and a female revolucionaria? That's a great question. Yeah. Any answers? <laughs> Um, I, I don't have an answer for that one. I, I think it's the same traits, no? Yeah. Except that we have those same, that those expectations are males. You expect them to do those things and you don't yeah. expect it of women. So therefore we don't expect it of ourselves. So I think that that's probably the main, yeah. main difference. And that's part of why we needed this book to show that that all women can, can do it is not just men that have those characteristics. Women have it, we just keep it submerged. And perhaps the, um, the perception is that women are not revolutionarias. Exactly. And so maybe that's another division that the men are not just expected, but are perceived as that, whereas women may not be. Well, we're getting close to the time. In fact, we're just at about eight o'clock. We can go a couple of minutes later. I'm gonna ask each one of you to just say some closing remarks. And um, so Kathy, you wanna start? Sure. Um, uh, I just want to say how proud I am of this book and, and this group of revolutionary writers writing about these revolutionary subjects in a very revolutionary time. 
and how grateful I am that it has come together and, and in gratitude and hope that it will inspire uh, the women on this call and, and the women that they know and the women that they know. Thank you. Ellen? Well, I think it's a, a wonderful book that's binational. I mean, really, it, it is, it's a product of Gloria and Saldua's way of being that binationalism isn't really binationalism, it's binaturalism. Yeah. And, and that this is how, how we exist. So it was wonderful for me to be in contact with those people that I knew in Mexico and be able to, to talk to them about that. Is finally starting to fill a gap of underrepresentation, of representation that has always been there, just hasn't been recognized. Hmm. Sandra? Well, I just hope that this book will allow people to do further investigations on the women mentioned here and the ones not mentioned, and for them to do that their own research uh, and exploration to bringing those women who are lost in the footnotes and the rubble of history to light in whatever way they can. Because, you know, we're, we're, we did this project uh, and it really would not have been taken off if uh, Ellen and Kathy hadn't been so uh, tenacious. You know, I was just a contributor, but they really did all the work. And I want to thank them for doing that. And anyone who says, well, how come, you know, you didn't, you forgot so-and-so, and there will be that. Well, <laughs> adelante, you know, you, you yeah. do the research and help us because all of us are working to bring these uh, women to light, to help us open paths for younger women, to for me to give me courage uh, and whether I'm doing the right thing in the life I'm living. But uh, más que nada in this time when people are feeling desanimados and tired and, un and frightened, and this is a good book to give you courage and give you animo. Absolutely. And to answer one of the questions, there's many that we left unanswered apologies we can't answer all of them but this question asks whether you have to be identified with a specific party uh, or any specific yes yeah, uh, identify with a specific or any political party to be revolutionary absolutely not <laughs> i think that's an answer that's easy and quick mm -hmm. And so thank you all so much. Muchas gracias. The next Maverick Book Club features tequila. So uh, and uh, Chantal will be here at, on this space. And uh, there will be uh, lots of information coming out. I don't know. I don't see it on the chat. Then maybe somebody can put it there. But it's going to be a wonderful discussion with an expert on tequila. Can we bring tequila? It's like a happy hour. Book club and virtual happy hour. Bring your own tequila. <laughs> thank you all so much. I las quiero mucho. Thank you. Thank Norma, you for all of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank, thank you all.